I have been in the same church all my life, and I have been building church for much of that time. Over three decades now, I have been in leadership and preaching and teaching the Word of God. And I guess as I'm approaching my 50th this year, I've got a little reflective in my old age, and I've taken some time and kind of sat back and looked at the church and looked at my three decades of building church and began to ask some questions. What have we done well and what have we done not so well? What have we taught strong and what have we maybe not taught as strong as we could? And and as I've been pondering those things recently, I, I, I began to realize that we actually, as the people of God, as the church of God, I think we've done a good job getting the message out there that, that God restores the broken. I, I think we've taught well that if you're broken in spirit, if you're broken in heart, if you're broken in your body, that when you come to him, he is the great restorer. He is the lifter of our head. He is the redeemer and the transformer of our lives. I think we have written great songs that are powerful about the redeeming, powerful, restorative grace of God. I think we have lyrics that we could all pull to mind that remind us that he is the one that binds up the brokenhearted. I think we have done a good job in the church making sure that we have been orators of the truth that if you are broken, you no longer need to stay broken because the healer is in the room. But on the flip side of that, I've realized that maybe we have failed to pay attention to another group of people that are in the room and you are in the room today. That when we hear messages about brokenness, that group of people say to themselves, well, this message is not for me, for I am not broken. I once was broken. I came to a place. I met my Savior. I met my Redeemer. I met my Restorer. And He put back my life. And I made Him Lord and Savior. So I no longer qualify myself as broken. And so we sit in church and we ignore certain lessons and we bypass certain and principles because we say to ourselves, this is not for me anymore. (laughs) And what I've realized is at any gathering of any crowd of any size, there are some that are broken that have just come to the realization that God can heal, but there are far more people in the room that are not broken, but you are out of order. (laughs) So today I want to speak to you, friend, you that are out of order. You that have said, I'm not broken, but you also have not acknowledged, but you are out of order. Just like a vending machine that you may see in some kind of facility somewhere, and the lights are on it, and it has drinks on the inside of it, and you walk up to it, and you're about to put your dollar inside the machine, and then you see the sign, and it just notifies you, hey, before you put your money in, just know this is out of order. And the lights are on and the drinks are present. And so it's still functioning, but it's not actually doing the job that it was designed to do because something on the inside of the device or the machinery is not quite aligned or wired correctly. So though it looks right and though it seems right, there's something about it that is out of order. And I'm telling you right now, I'm describing some of your lives that your life looks right and it seems right and it can even sound right, but you know if you were honest in a moment right now with God, there are things about your life that are seriously out of order. And I'm here to let you know that this year will be a repeat of last year unless you fix the fact that these things are out of order. There is a reordering that must come back to your life, to your relational world, your emotional world, your mental world, your physical world. And if you don't reorder, then you will end up living this year where you function, but you do not flourish. You survive, but you do not thrive. And today, your marriage deserves more than just functioning. It deserves to flourish. Your relational world deserves more than just getting by. It deserves to be something that is producing great fruit and harvest in your life. So where do we need to get our life back in order? I love to give you a visual because I think it sticks with you sometimes beyond the message. But if I was to use this jacket as an example of your life, it's like every day, every week, every month, every year, you put your life on, your responsibilities, your relationships, the things that 
encompass and are, are your life and you put your life on and some of you have put your life on at the beginning of this year and, and it's your life and it fits but, but, but something is off. And no matter, no matter what happens this year, it's right but it, it's not right. <laughs> it's on but it's off. You're in but it's out. And no matter what I do to tell you how great my life is, no matter what I, what I do to pretend that it's all put together, the truth is, unless I'm willing to deal with what is out of order, this thing is never going to find its order. And some of you are trying to swap your life, swap your relationships, change this, change that. And I'm letting you know all of those changes will not change this. And it's the willingness to get involved in what needs to be reordered that will change this year for you. And it will be a year like no other year. Because God does not want you to live with an out of order life. God wants to help you put back in order the things that the world has pulled and told you are in the right order. And the only way you do it is by beginning to unbutton what has the wrong place so that you can put the button back on what should have first place. So today, I want to help you get your life back in order. I want to help you understand that this life that we are all given is a gift. It is not supposed to be a pressure or a stress, but if you put the wrong thing in the top button, you will have the wrong fruit flowing and growing from your life. If, if you put success as the top button, I guarantee you stress. If you put people pleasing as your top button, I guarantee you exhaustion. Some of these things that you have placed as a top button in your life are why you are exhausted and tired and stressed out and not yourself all the time because the top button is wrong. <laughs> the Bible says in Matthew 11, verse 28, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. It's time for some of you to recover your life. Get your joy back, get your peace back, get your sleep back, get your priorities right. And then he says this, ah, come to me and I'll show you how to take a real rest. And what I wanted to say after that line is I wanted to say, so we're gonna go to Hawaii on sabbatical. So you're going to have six months off. But it doesn't say that. What it says is, if you want to learn how to have a real rest, if you want to learn how to recover your life, you're going to walk with me and you're going to work with me. And you're going to watch how I do it and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So there is a way to work that is not stressful. There is a way to work that is not frantic. There is a way to work that has a rhythm of grace to it. I think one of the greatest lessons we have missed that Jesus teaches us in the Bible is his relationship with work and his relationship with how he prioritized his life. I have searched my Bible. I have gone through every version. I have looked for it and I cannot find one piece of scripture where it says, Jesus was so stressed out. He said to the disciples, hey, I know on my calendar are 10 lepers tomorrow, but I can't get to them tomorrow, move them to Friday. Because I got overrun over here teaching this crowd. Then I had to feed a load of people that didn't have lunch. And now I'm just stressed out about this woman that touched the hem of my garden. You know, I don't have time right now to fit the lepers in. Could you call them, reschedule them? I'll pass by on Friday. I'll find it anywhere. I don't find Jesus anywhere feeling like his schedule was running him. I don't find Jesus anywhere stressing out about what needs to get done. And this is Jesus. He had quite a big job, people. His job brief was to be the savior of the world. Hello. So where did we think we were so important? 
And Jesus had three years of public ministry in which to do everything that he was sent to do. So how, when you only have three years, are you not stressed out? Are you not running around like a crazy person? Are you not having scheduling issues? How is there such a rhythm of grace to your life that Jesus runs his calendar in a way that makes no sense? Jesus is like, hey, I just think I'll stop by a well and have a chat. Jesus is like, hey, there's a guy up a tree. I think I'll go over for dinner. I see the exact opposite in Jesus' life because he's modeling to us something that we have so missed in our Western culture. He's modeling a rhythm of grace. He's modeling when the top button is right, all the other buttons find their place. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 38, he said, I came from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Man, if that was all I said today, your mind would be blown because when you think about it, he just says, all I have to do is put the top button of what God sent me to do and everything else is going to take care of itself. (laughs) Some of you are so stressed out and, 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 and you're praying, God, take it away. God's like, this is not on me, fool. I didn't plan that schedule. I didn't agree to those things. I didn't put that pressure in your world. You chose it. And now your marriage is paying for it. And your children are paying for it. And your health is paying for it. And your mental health is paying for it. But if you come to me, and if you walk with me, and you work with me, you'll find the unforced rhythm of grace for your life. So today, it's the day to put back in order what is out of order. It's a day for adjustment. I have a friend that lives in California, and uh, I had a day off, and she said, hey, let's go do something fun, and she's a good friend, so I trusted that her version of fun would be my version of fun. So when we pulled up at a building that said chiropractor on the front, I was like, why are we here? I don't need a chiropractor. I don't want a chiropractor. All kind of weird noises come out of those offices that I don't want to be making. And she said, you know, I just noticed, she said, that you have such tension. She goes, I think it's from all your traveling and airplane flights and lifting suitcases. She goes, honestly, he's a great guy. Just just give him a few moments. And I went in and the chiropractor began to do what chiropractors do. And as he did it, I felt the Holy Spirit say, why are my people so resistant? If they just let me adjust them, freedom would come back. If they just would let me adjust them. There'd be a sense of breath that would come back into their lungs. But we're like, no, it's okay, God, I got it. I'm the savior of the world. No, you're not. So stop thinking you are. And so I learned a long time ago, if I'm gonna still be serving God when I'm turning 50, If I'm still going to be loving my husband 31 years in, if I'm still going to be loving those kids that are turning into their 20s, if I'm still going to be building the house of God and preaching the Word of God, i got to get some top buttons right because I won't have the energy to sustain that on my own. So I want to give you some gold today, and I'm calling it gold because it is gold because it costs me a lot to find this out. And I'm handing it over to you for free. You're welcome. I want to give you three principles that are key to my life, that I I think are key to what God says we should have in our lives as his people, that have become top buttons for me. And they work every single time. The first one is born out of a scripture that God gave me when I first started to do what I'm doing now. And by the way, I never wanted to do what I'm doing now, so be careful what you tell God you'll never do. But when you walk with him and you work with him, his plan has to be greater than your plan. And so when I began to step up and began to open my mouth, I felt God say, I'm going to show you your calling. I got a little excited. I was like, okay, this is exciting. Show me my calling, Lord. And then I got the scripture that God gave me about my calling. I was like, that's really disappointing. Can I have another scripture? (laughs) I'm just being honest. 
It wasn't very exciting. It wasn't very attractive. But God took me to a passage that's changed my life. And it's found in Exodus 17. And it's the story of a battle that raged with the Amalekites. And it plays out this way, and it describes what was going on. It says this. It says, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. I remember reading the scripture and saying, okay, God, I get it. I'm called to be Joshua. I'm going to go on the front lines for you. I'm going to fight. I'm going to lead the, the, the people of God into, into battle. We're going to take the ground from the enemy. And I felt God say, no, you're not Joshua. I was like, yes, Lord, I am not Joshua because I am holy Moses. <laughs> Sorry, Lord, for shrinking the anointing on my life. I mean, I must be Moses, right? I mean, Moses, I'm going to part waters. I'm going to deliver, help be a deliverer of your people. I'm going to speak your word and things are going to happen. There's going to be miracles. It's going to be amazing. I felt God say, no, you're not Moses. I was like, but God, there's only two people left in the story. And they're basically glorified armpit holders. Surely, that is not what you're saying is the call of my life. And I felt God say, that's exactly what I'm saying, is the call of your life. Because your top button, Charlotte, must be mission over position. Let me illustrate with my team that are going to help me. Because I love to see it visually, because it helps paint a picture. Here's Moses, holy mo, in the middle. And Moses has a job. Your job is you've got to keep your arms uplifted. I need you to keep your arms uplifted, Moses. As long as your arms are uplifted, whatever Josh, Joshua is doing down here, whatever the army are doing down here, as long as your arms are lifted, they're taking territory. They're advancing the kingdom. They are winning and defeating the evil. How many times do we get so enamored with what Joshua looks like and what Joshua's doing and the person in the front and the person on the front line and the person that looks like they're making it all happen and little do we know that actually without this, there is no this. That actually it's, it's not about Joshua's position, it's about everybody agreeing about the mission. It's the agreement about the mission that means that everybody succeeds in their position. But what the enemy does, he, he tries to trick us and tell us, oh no, you need the position. And when you have the position, that's when you'll see the things of God happen. No, that is not how the Bible tells the stories. That is not how the gospel works. It's not about you getting the position. It's about you understanding the mission. And so Moses goes and he's upholding his arms and it says he gets tired. So they give him a rock to sit on. He sits on the rock and as he sat on the rock, his arms begin to fall. And when his arms begin to fall, they begin to lose down here. No one down there knows that the reason we're losing is because what's happening up here. And so, and so God covers it because he's like, okay, your job is you just got to keep those arms in the air. And so that's it. That's, that's all they have to do. I mean, let's be honest. This is not an attractive job. I'm pretty sure in that time in history, you know, Moses wasn't wearing a suit. And he didn't have on deodorant. And he hadn't had a shower. And it was hot. And he was wearing a cloak. And his armpits were freely aroming the area around him. This was, not, this, was not a, this was not a nice spot to be in. When did we make ministry about how nice the spot is that I'm put in? Wow. Uh, moi, on the car park? <laughs> Do you not understand the anointing on my life? You want me to work in kids' church? Do you not know that I am writing a best-selling album in my mind?
Do you want me to put out chairs? Do you not know my ability on the guitar? <laughs> and while ever it's about your position, you miss the bigger calling of the mission. And so what the enemy does is he starts to whisper, not in the ear of Joshua, not in the ear of Moses. He starts to whisper in the ear of every Aaron and her. You know what? There's a better opportunity this way. You know what? There's something more for you this way. And the more he gets in the ear of every Aaron and her, the more this begins to happen. And all of a sudden we don't realize, but I drift down. I can't make it every Sunday because I got a gig. Oh, I can't, I can't really give anymore because, you know, I'm investing in my, my thing. Oh, you know, I can't serve because, you know, I'm just in a season where, you know, the Lord's just speaking to me. You know, I, I might be at this church this week, but I'm not sure because there might be an opportunity at this church next week. And while ever we're chasing whatever that looks like, we don't realize that, that what we think is not affecting anyone else is affecting the mission that God had that involves everybody else. Because Aaron and hers have to understand it is not about my position. It is about the mission. And if I don't play my part, the big battle is going to be lost. Thanks, guys. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. It doesn't say, not even in the Amplified, not even in the Message Version, seek first things. And the kingdom will be added to you. And yet we have a, a whole culture, a whole world that tells you, go for it. Go for your dreams. Go seek the position. Go get the promotion. Go get more money. And listen, God wants to bless you. He's not against any of that. But if that is your top button, when you get your dream, you will control your dream, and eventually your dream will control you. That's why David, hello, David. I mean, David was pretty gifted. He was pretty anointed. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than have some position in the tents of the wicked. I'd rather have a place where mission is bigger than my position. When did we turn from those that are supposed to have zeal for the house consumers to those who are consumers of the house? If there's not a position, it's not for me. If what I want is not fulfilled, it's not for me. Even the disciples got it messed up in Matthew 20 when the boy's mom comes to Jesus and she's like, hey, hey, Jay. Like, 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 you know, just, you know, those seats, you know, those little seats at the, at the right hand, you know, those, 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 those seats of power and influence. I think my boys would do great there. Would you give the boys that position? Jesus is like, you have no idea what you're asking for. I think God looks at some of us and he's like, you have no idea what you're asking for. And if you got what you're asking for, it would not bless you, it would kill you. I mean, reality check, people. It says in the Bible, the Son of Man did not come to be served, <laughs> but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. If the Son of Man didn't come to be served, who are we? I'm just going to say it like it is because I leave in a few hours and you'll never see me again maybe and so I don't really care. Write to the pastor about the speaker from England. I'm just going to say it. If you ain't serving someone other than your own self and your own agenda and your own dream, your buttons are out of line. Yeah. Oh, I don't know where to serve. Pick an area. I don't care. I'm sure there's a need for more kids' workers. I'm sure there's a need for people to put out chairs. I'm sure there's a need for people to clean bathrooms. I'm sure, oh, that, I don't feel that that's what God's anointed me to do. Please. Please. <laughs> <sighs> 
Stop it. Grow up. It's time. There's a world to reach. There's people going to hell. And we don't want to serve because it's not my thing. Number two, you've got to put motivation higher than expectation. <laughs> kind of sounds like it's a contradiction because we're supposed to expect and we're supposed to believe and there's a good expecting, but there's also a bad expecting. You need to be very careful that your expectation never overrides your motivation because if it does and your top button is expectation, then you will be open for manipulation. And now we've moved from serving that's sacrificial to serving that's transactional. In other words, if I do this for you, what are you going to do for me? If I come here, I have an expectation of what you'll do for me over there. If I give, I have an expectation of what you'll give me back. If I serve, I have an expectation of your applause and your approval. If, if, if I'm involved, then I have an expectation that you're going to do this back for my involvement. Be very careful that you don't allow your expectations to be greater than your motivation. For if Jesus ran the, the whole ministry based on this principle, all of us would be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. Jesus is like, I expect you to get your act together before I'm ready to forgive you. I expect you to never doubt me if I'm going to be faithful towards you. I expect you to forgive if I'm ever going to forgive you. Imagine if this whole gospel, if the gift of salvation was based on expectation, no one would qualify. You know, Jesus came and he healed people with no expectation of a thank you. I know we read that there was 10 lepers and one said thanks, but I think it's in there to let us know, hey, ratio-wise, one said thanks, but he still would have healed them. Yeah. Jesus healed 10, expecting not one to say thank you. Jesus delivered people not expecting a letter of congratulations. Jesus fed people not expecting them to come and give him something in return. Jesus' ministry was not based on expectation, and therefore he was not able to be open to manipulation. <laughs> if I preached with an expectation of a response, I wouldn't go some places anymore. But like, no thank you. Like, that, that was too hard. But if I only preached because I knew there was an expectation of reward and applause and adulation, then I'm open to manipulation. That's why Jesus, he, when the crowd responded and they loved him, he didn't set up camp there. He didn't pitch his tent there. He didn't start selling his merch there. Jesus is like, I appreciate it, but I got to go. I got to move on because I can't let my ministry be based on this expectation that you seem to be fulfilling. I have to let it be a motivation and my motivation is love. That's why when the Pharisees tried to test Jesus on his expectations, you know, what do you want us to do? What's the legal requirements? What's the legalism involved? Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to answer your question and I'm going to let you know what my top button is. And they said, teacher, which in God's law is most important? He said, it's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your passion, all your prayer, all your intelligence. This is the most important. This is the top button. This is the first on the list. And you want another button? Love others as you love yourself. Jesus is like, I have set my motivation. So I'm going to love you even if you are unlovely. I'm going to love you even if you are unkind. I'm going to love you even if you talk bad about me. I'm going to love you even if you walk away from me. I'm going to love you even if you shout, crucify him. And yet, Everything we do gets tainted by an expectation. Well, I'll do, but will you do? You know what the Bible says in Luke 6? I love the Bible because you can't get mad at me because this is the Bible. It says this in Luke 6 verse 31. It says, if you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run of mill sinners do that. <laughs> if you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Wow. Bible's saying, that's not the right button, guys. 
Well, I'll help them because I think they can afford to help me. Well, I'll I'll do something kind for them because I'm pretty sure they're going to reward me for doing something kind. But when you are kind to someone that can't repay your kindness, and when you love someone that is unlovable, and when you bless someone who has no ability to bless you back, you've suddenly moved from expectation to motivation. What is your motivation in your serving? What is your motivation in your giving? Well, if I give, do I get higher up the pole? Well, if I give, do I get a reserved seat? Like, how does this system work around here? It's not a system. My motivation is that I give because he gave his only son for me. Thirdly, you've got to put legacy above what's temporary. Now, listen. I don't mind a trip to Ikea. I mean, it's European, so I'm kind of favorable to a bit of Ikea. But when I buy a piece of Ikea furniture and when I put it together following those illustrations, and when I place it in my living room or in my bedroom, I don't look at the Ikea furniture and think, wow, I'm gonna hand you down to my children's children. There ain't nothing about my Ikea furniture that speaks of legacy. It speaks of what's temporary. I'm building the furniture to fix an immediate need. I'm building the furniture to give me a solution for what I currently need. But there's nothing about the investment in Ikea that's thinking about my children's children because I know this thing ain't going to last. But so many have made our top button what is temporary. Well, what's in it for me? Well, what benefits me? Well, what do I need now? And we're storing up the treasures that are temporary, that are only fueling our lives and our dream and our ideas. But God has a complete different way that he asks us to live our life. He asks us to live like the heroes of faith. The heroes of faith that went before us. And it says of them in Hebrews 11, each one of these people of faith died not having in their hand what was promised, but still believing. How did they do it? They saw it way off in the distance. They waved their greeting and they accepted the fact that they were transients in this world. And people who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. Man, when I get around people that have legacy as a top button instead of temporary, the conversations are entirely different. The the things they're investing in are entirely different. The choices they're making are entirely different. So many of you today are sat on a seat that you didn't pay for. Kids are in a space using equipment, using facilities that you didn't pay for. But somebody came to the house. They didn't just think about my chair and my coffee afterwards. Somebody came to the house, they didn't even have children or their children were way past infant care. But they carried a top button in their life called legacy. And they said, God, I might not be here to see who sits in this chair. And I might not be here to see which child is held in that nursery. But I see it in my mind's eye and I see it in my heart. And I wave at it in the distance. And I say, God, because of that, I choose this. Because of that, I sow this. Because of that, I build this. This building is great if it's just about you. But it's not great if it's about the communities around this building. Because right now we have people sat in overflow. Right now we have people that can't even be in the same room. Right now we have people that can't get in a parking lot. But you got in the parking lot, so it's fine. Well, if we live that way, then you know what? The church will be out of order. But when you live in a way that goes, man, that's not good enough. I want to give something. I want to serve something. I want to put my life into something that outlives me, that outlasts me. 
I don't know a lot of you in here are younger than me. Sad when you can say that statement, but I am at that stage. I know you are. But can I tell you, don't wait till you're old to have a legacy mindset. Like lead your life with legacy as a top button. What can I do today that plants seed for someone's tomorrow? What can I speak today that will echo into the annals of the future? What can I write today? What can I build today? What can I give today that will fall with the gospel when I am no longer able to speak the gospel? I have given my life to legacy. I just want to burst a bubble. Like, I think people sometimes see what I do and they think, wow, it's so exciting. Flying on an airplane, staying in a hotel, going around the world. And I guess it could be, if that's your top button. But I really love my kids. And I really love my husband. And I'm an introvert by nature. And I really don't do green rooms. And I really don't like long haul flights. And I really don't care to sleep in a different bed every night. But when it's not about you, it's amazing what you'll say yes to. And I didn't know that I would see your face today, or see your face today, or see your face today. And I didn't know that this would be a word that would help you in something that you've been struggling with for a long time. And I didn't know how God would take my willingness to get on a plane and come to the other side of the Atlantic and be here and speak this word. I had no idea, but in my soul and in my spirit, there was something in the future and I was waving at it. And I'm like, I think God, if I'll just live for legacy instead of temporary, you'll take care of everything else. And in a world of pop-up shops, Instagram, trends, culture that's all about me, cancel culture that cancels what's not about me or for me. We have drifted so far from what this book is all about because people actually died and were martyred for you to have these truths today. But we don't want to go in the rain to church in case our new sneakers get ruined. We've come a long way from what it actually is gonna take if we are actually gonna see revival. So today, maybe you're not broken. I suspect many of you, because of the grace and the kindness of God, you are not broken anymore. But maybe, just maybe, you are out of order. And maybe today, the Holy Spirit wants to be your chiropractor. You know, when I sat down in that chiropractor, I was nervous. I was like, they're going to hurt. And I found the more I was nervous and the more I resisted, the more it did hurt. But once I relaxed and let him do what he was trained to do, it was not as painful as I thought it was going to be. So the adjustment can either be painful or it can be easy. Because when you work with Him and you walk with Him, there's a rhythm of grace that adjusts your life. And some of you are waiting for a collision to adjust your life. You're waiting for a crisis to fix your marriage. You're waiting for one of your kids to turn around and tell you to slow down before you slow down. But what if we would all be humble enough to say, Holy Spirit, adjust me. You know, after I got adjusted, nothing looked different. But my breath was greater. The capacity of my lungs was better. And there's something about God wanting to put breath in your lungs this year that are not, that it's not to be used on your thing. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but, but I know I'm speaking to some in particular in here. And I know this is Nashville, and I know music's a big part of the culture. So maybe it's just a body of people in here, and that's your thing. And you're like, yeah, God, use me. Yeah, God, open doors to me. God's like, and what will you use that breath for? What will you use that opportunity for? Because we're living in days where we don't need you that know the Creator. 
acting like those that don't know the Creator. So many wasted words when we don't have time to waste them. 